Thank you so much for being with us tonight. This is the 21st uh, TAC lecture at William & Mary. This is one of my very favorite events every semester. Um, and I can tell you, um, it is not because I get to see a lot of you that you know we don't get to interact very frequently during our uh, daily work, but it is because um, it, this lecture captures everything that William and Mary is, and more. So we get to showcase the work that our faculty are doing, and we get to really connect it to things that are of interest to our world, our, our community, our society. And there is no better way to do that. I try to do that on a daily basis, but there's no better way than to listen to our faculty talk about their work directly to you. And so, thank you for being with us tonight. Um, this is um, a topic that was not really chosen because it's well done and you know the, work, the quality of the work is excellent. Yes, of course, that's the reason. But, <laughs> but um, not just that. It really is something that uh, there is a volume of activity behind Danielle's work and how it connects with uh, what other things are happening on our ancient campus, Brafferton 300 anniversary, and other things that you are aware of. So it is really a great opportunity to bring everything together tonight and give ourselves a treat by listening to Danielle. Um, I would like to acknowledge uh, the people who made this possible. And I do this every time, and every time I feel even more grateful when I look back and see who has really shown up on this stage and discussed with you their life's work. So I want to acknowledge the tax who are here tonight, class of 78. So I just want to say, Thank you, Martha and Carl, for this gift. It, it means a lot, and we hope that you are enjoying this as much as our community does. Um, I just want to really say a few things about Danielle. And by a few things, I, I have a few pages, so bear with me. Uh, and this is just a summary of the main points of Danielle's work and career. Um, before I go into Danielle and what she has done in her career, I want to say that as a person who was born outside this country, and um, I always took pride in the history of my country. For those of you who do not know, and I don't understand how you could not, you do not already know, um, I'm from Greece, and there is a special affinity among uh, ancient cultures. Because even if we don't want to acknowledge it or we don't really think about it on our daily lives, there is tremendous significance in what has happened in the past that is influencing what we really are today and how we live and work and create new things today. So one of the biggest um, exciting things that I learned when I uh, arrived at the United, in the United States as a graduate student was to discover this culture of our indigenous people and their contributions to world civilizations. And so I don't wanna really make everything about Greece because I, I'm known to tend to do that, uh, but this is not about that. It's about the significance of what we have here, what this campus has as part of the bigger picture of what um, civilizations that existed in, in this geographic space have contributed to our university, to our civilization, to our country, to our students, to everyone. So on to Danielle. Um, Danielle Moretti Langholz is a cultural anthropologist who received her PhD from the University of Oklahoma. She came to William & Mary from the American Museum of Natural History in New York and focused her work on the political resurgence of Virginia's native communities. A protege of Wampanoag leader Thomasina Jordan, she is the Thomasina E. Jordan Director of the American Indian Resource Center in the Department of Anthropology at William & Mary. 
As a teaching professor in the Department of Anthropology, Danielle has demonstrated a strong commitment to teaching, student mentoring, and civically engaged work involving her undergraduate and graduate students, some of them are here today, in numerous research and grant projects. Her applied work runs the gamut from ethnographic studies of undeserved, underserved, sorry, underserved native communities for the Commonwealth of Virginia to two national register nominations for tribally significant structures and testifying twice before the US Congress in support of federal recognition for Virginia's tribes. The video, in our own words, Voices of Virginia Indians, written and produced by four of her undergraduate students, received a national award from the American Association for State and Local History. Her 2020 online exhibition, Rising, the American Indian Movement and the Third Space of Sovereignty, co-curator with students in her senior seminar on native sovereignty, was awarded a gold medal by the Southeastern Museums Association. Danielle served as an advisor to former governor, Mark Warner, on the Virginia Council on Indians, as a liaison for the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian, and as a consultant for state and federal committees planning the 400th anniversary commemorations of the English settlement in Georgetown, at, in, at Jamestown. Between 2003 and 2010, she established the Virginian Indian Advisory Board to assist with the archaeological excavations at where um, Awakomoko. In 2010, Danielle invited four native William and Mary alumni to form the Brafferton Legacy Group and participate in the multi-year excavations during the renovations on, on the Brafferton building. Additionally, Danielle serves as the curator of American art at the Mascarelli Museum of Art. Since 2007, she has curated six major exhibitions. And to understand the gamut of her work, I'm going to really name these exhibitions. A retrospective of the work of Jean Quick to C. Smith, In Reach of Memory Still, the Art and Legacy of the Kiowa Five, Glenn Close, A Life in Costume, which, by the way, was nominated for an award by the Costume Society of America, Building the Brafferton, the founding, funding, and legacy of American's Indian School, 1619-2019, and most recently, Shared Ideologies. She's actively working to expand the collection of native art on our campus. This year, as I mentioned, and as you know, we are commemorating the 300th anniversary of the completion of the Brafferton Indian School Building in 1723. The 2019 volume, Building the Brafferton, the Founding, Funding, and Legacy of America's Indian School, edited by Danielle and Dr. Buck Woodard, is the outcome of more than a decade of research seeking to uncover the complex 18th century interactions among indigenous students tribal nations, and colonial powers at the William & Mary. Tonight, Danielle will share some insights from the Brafferton research and thoughts about reconnecting historically significant native narratives to our campus. Danielle moretti Langholz, we welcome you as tonight's TAC faculty lecturer. <laughs> Thank you, Provost. I think she said everything I needed to say about this. Um, good evening, and thank you for coming. I want to start by acknowledging that 2023 is the year of the arts at William & Mary, as well as the tricentenary, as was mentioned, of the Bradford and Indian School. And that will be the focus of my remarks. It's also November, and November is Native American Heritage Month in the state of Virginia and the nation. And in honor of that, I would like to invite uh, one of my former students, uh, uh, Matthew Solomon, who's uh, also a member of the Monacan Indian Nation, 
and a recent president of the American Indian Students Association to give our land acknowledgement. Matthew, would you come up, please? William & Mary acknowledges the indigenous peoples who are the original inhabitants of the lands our campus is on today. The Charon Haka Nadewe, Chickahominy, Eastern Chickahominy, Mattapanai, Monacan, Nansmund, Nadewe, Pamunkey, Padawomic, Upper Mattapanai, and Rappahannock tribes. And pay our respects to tribal members, past and present. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. <coughs> and this is a map um, of where these tribes are. They're all vibrant communities and really important in our story here. Um, in my remarks, I'm going to share some of the aspects of my decade-long research journey to uncover more about the Bradford and Indian School, and I'll share bits and pieces of that new information. And secondly, I would like to frame the discussion within an anthropological framework or an anthropological lens to situate the positionality of indigenous people and their attempts to resituate themselves within the changing political and military dynamics of the 18th century. Thirdly, and most importantly, I will highlight some of the outcomes resulting from efforts to reconnect the new Bradford in research with four specific native communities. A very familiar structure, a beautiful structure. One of the three buildings of William & Mary's historic campus. The Bradford in building is part of the built environment that is a strong visual symbol of Imperial England's dominance in North America and Williamsburg's centrality within colonial history. We can spend time discussing the architectural merits of this magnificent historic campus, but also we should remember this building exudes power and strength. In my published work, I have referenced, referred to the Brafferton as a silent sentinel, because over the years, its voice as a native school has been silenced. Yes, its presence remains and demands our attention. The received history, and what I mean by this concept, is what we have been taught to think about the building, what we think we know. That historians had thoroughly explored the school's history and done their best with fragmentary documents in ledger books and legislative acts and personal correspondence ended with a conclusion that few Indians attended the school and there was no evidence that the students learned anything. In short, the school was considered a failure and had a very discouraging conclusions about it. This slide shows examples of fragmentary uh, documents, but it's a very bounded history. You see here three key documents related to the Bradford and Indian School, the Andros Charter, on your left, um, stating very early in that first line the reason or the motive for the, our school being founded that it would be a seminary, quote, for the Church of Virginia to be established, that the youth may be piously educated in good letters and good manners, and that the Christian faith may be propagated amongst the Western Indians, end quote. So this is high up in the first sentence of this. Basically, the Royal Charter is saying there's a missionary component and a key factor to the establishing of the school. And it's hard for us in subsequent years to ever get beyond that statement. And so I think it's important tonight to think beyond that statement. The middle image is a portrait of the scientist Robert Boyle. This portrait was sent to our campus in 1732. We didn't have a museum then but it was sent to hang in the Bradford Inn building as it was to be an image reminding Native students of their wealthy benefactor in, back in England. So how does this fit with the story? Our founder, the Reverend James Blair, 
convinced the executors of Boyle's estate to use some of his extensive wealth to construct and sustain an Indian school as was called for in our charter. Boyle's executors were persuaded by the argument. And in 1659, monies, lots of monies, were used to purchase six, a 1,600-acre estate, very productive agricultural land in a place called Brafferton, England. Thus, this is the source of the name of the Indian school. The Indian school is named for the estate in England that was purchased by Roy, Robert Boyle's um, money. And I'll share a bit more about that. But, and next, we have... Um, a piece or an image of Robert Boyle's will. All these pieces are of uh, documents are in SWEM, Research Center Library, and that's pretty special. So we had some of these documents here, but what do they add up to? Limited, bounded information. In the next slide, you're looking at a portrait of the late Thomasina Jordan, which also now hangs in special collections. Thomasine is a native activist and mentor to me during the last six years of her life. And she was the very first person to encourage me to restudy the Braffordans' history. A member of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe, Thomasina knew her own tribal history and that five men from her community attended Harvard's Indian school which was established in 1655. The school closed in 1693, having educated or had only five students during that whole time, five native students at the Indian school. The wooden Indian building was demolished, but in 1970, Harvard sort of felt that they needed to come to terms with this history, started to research the history, established their uh, Indian Native Studies program. And uh, by, I think it's 1997, Thomasina was still alive, Harvard uh, put up a plaque honoring those students. And so this was in her mind. And there was this an Indian school at Harvard, and they've done the research. What about your school? And you still have the building. How could it be a failure? Look at this building. So it's kind of pushing me. Thomasina was pushing me in a direction. Now this one. And you say, what does this have to do with the Bradford and Indian School? <laughs> but it does. So here's the story. You may remember 2006, William and Mary faced a mascot issue. NCAA contacted the school about the feathers that were in the logo, using the terms that the feathers represented a hostile and abusive symbol. Well, I got a phone call from former Dean Jeff Weiss, a great fellow and friend of mine, and he said, okay, Danielle, we got a problem. You're running the American Indian Resource Center. What do we do? So I, about the feathers? Oh, I think what you do is call the tribal leaders in Virginia and ask them. And he said, great idea, you call them. <laughs> so I did. I did. Then we did not have any federal tribes at that time, we had eight state recognized tribes. And I'm going to summarize eight phone calls and the responses because they were remarkably similar. Number one. Every tribe said, we don't want any mascots. No problem with that, no mascot. Two, I'm not sure feathers are a mascot. We're not sure. Three, you know, we haven't heard from you in about two centuries, and you're calling about feathers. I think. <laughs> it didn't really come across as a joke. It's, it's funny when I tell it. But I was kind of like, oh my gosh, right. So I went back to the dean with that story. Um, but it doesn't really end there. That story had national press all around the country. And what started happening back in Department of Anthropology, when we actually had regular phones then, 
I don't know how I started getting phone calls from tribal communities. And some of those communities said, hi, it's the Delaware Nation of Oklahoma. We saw this story. Hi, this is the Shawnee group. We're in Oklahoma. We're this group. We're that group. Maybe started out two calls a week. It lasted for maybe six weeks. But the point was, we think we used to be at that school. Do you have a program? Can we come back? I didn't have an answer. And I remember those calls kind of painfully. But I do know that very, very much this mascot issue opened my eyes to the fact that Native people elsewhere had some relationship or some memory or something that they wanted to know about our school and how could we answer that. This generated what I call a new direction in the research, which starts by going over everything everybody else has done, go back to those original sources. And it's an understatement to say 10 years, Peggy. It was more than that. But it's easy to say a decade, right? So, um, And I put a team in place of great students. But we were also cognizant of the fact that other stories were emerging about boarding schools that were extremely negative. We thought, what are we walking into? Some really serious issues. And one thing we wanted to know was, what is this school ab about? Who's here? Why are they here? And it, how does this school compare to or differ from other 19th and 20th century boarding schools? So that was often in my mind. As well as, I mentioned, bringing an anthropological lens to this, using our training to think about a Braffordian narrative within the context of social relations and the indigenous landscape and the, the very interconnected 18th century Atlantic world. And you might not think to go there, for the world was changing in the 18th century. But this slide is that example. This slide is from 1765, school's up and running. And it is a reminder the world that which we live in right now is, being, is starting to be connected right there during this colonial period. So placing Brafford and students and their respective tribal communities in their own world as active agents within a rising mercantile capitalism, England's political and military agenda to assert hegemony or power over both indigenous people and natural resource within the area they are controlling, now may be a new way to think about the Bradford and Indian School. It was, in some ways, I would argue, a response to the chaos of the 18th century world. Native people are trying to position themselves to ensure their future survival in a fast-changing colonial world. What are their options? Resistance, warfare, negotiating treaty agreements, fleeing the area, to going to the West, possibly educating some some of their students in the language of the colonizers so they can better understand what these documents are saying, what they're agreeing to, and trust the people who are interpreting for their people. We can already see, sorry, I'll have to turn around because that's, that's out, the changes that, that are already happening in these portraits of known and famous individuals. We have uh, Asanako here, 1762, appointed by Joshua Reynolds, a Cherokee leader. Look, you can see by his clothing and by his stance, yes, he's native, but he's already addressing, adopting positions and clothing aspects of colonizers. That doesn't mean he's giving in, that he doesn't think he's Cherokee. He's adapting to a changing world, as we all do. Joseph Brandt on the other side, 1776, Mohawk leader, allied with the British. Im important painting by George Romney. Sending a few students a year to the Bradford and Indian School was a possible option for Native people. 
I'd like to view it as an act of native agency and part of a survival strategy. Tribes wanted some of their people to be able to translate colonial, do translate colonial documents. They wanted their own interpreters, not the interpreters of the colonial government. The goal of missionization among the Western Indians was a successful argument in establishing a lucrative funding stream for the school. However, I argue that focusing narrowly on the missionary efforts obfuscates other dynamic forces underway in North America for Native people. It's another uh, slide here that I think is special. This is Kunashote, also a Cherokee chief, Francis Parsons' magnificent portrait of him. Both these Cherokee individuals were on our campus in the 1760s. We can place them there without a doubt. They're here on our campus. They see a portrait of King George, and they say, you know what, we like that. We like to meet him. And the British say, we'll, we'll bring you over, and uh, we'll, we'll get your portraits made, too. So these are real individuals at our campus. No doubt, I think it's reasonable to think they cross from what today is the president's house across the way to the Bradford and say, you know, a couple of, uh, can we have some interpreters over to dinner? They're at dinner at the, at the house. Um, going about the research meant going many different places. Uh, my student, then student, Buck Woodard, Will Foster, uh, and I went back and forth to archives. William and Mary is a rich source of them. I went to Harvard, National Archives in DC, multiple trips to the UK to examine ecclesiastical ar archives at Lambeth Palace. That's what you see behind you. York, England. Brafford in England. Thank you to my husband who drove me around all over the place on the wrong side of the road. And after 10 years or more, we gathered enough new information to group what we found in three broad categories. Founding, funding, and legacy. We use the term, we began to use the term America's Indian School because it became clear to us Rather than being a failure, the Bradford and Indian School was the most impactful Indian school in North America during the 18th century. That's a huge statement, and I am not afraid to make that statement. No way. How does this happen if I think that I've said that um, documents are fragmentary? Looking elsewhere, looking out at the world in which Native people are living. These images on the screen are an example of where the kinds of things we're looking at, maps and land negotiations, changes in land. The image of tobacco, which is a native plant now being grown and, and shipped, and William and Mary is making um, money off of that, a native plant, as well as the far image that really symbolizes the native participation in the deer skin and other kinds of trade, particularly the, the natives living in the west of this coastal area that we are in. New evidence could be seen that directly related to the tribes who were sending their sons to the Braffordan. Here's where we made the connection. Who's at the Braffordan? Which groups are involved in this kind of transaction of money? Now it's as if like things begin to clear, and we could see uh, here, this may be hard for you to see, this is one of multiple kinds of documents that talk about the, the trade in animal skins and furs. This area is document rich. All kinds of, uh, for we, don't, we don't think much about this. this was, native people were in, involved in this trade. They got involved in, and saw benefits and disbenefits of it. That's another side aspect of this. But this evidence showed us that all of this related directly to who was at the Bradford and Indian School. This is a little bit funny. You see lots of these three columns for money, and my students are like, why are there three columns? You know, pounds, shilling, pence? They're like, no. <laughs> That's a different money system. But it, it, but it adds up. So we find these kinds of things, and who's involved. 
and when things are happening with dates and the pattern emerges. Um, this map was really fabulous to find. We found, Buck and I found a written, handwritten note that said 19, I forget, 28 or 29, on a trip to the UK, we bought the Bradford and map. I have been looking for the Bradford and map at SWEM. And one day, it's one of those glorious days, somebody from Special Collections, Kim Sims, who's not here now, but she called. She said, can you look, come over? I think I might have something you want to see. I just, like, what can I say? This is so incredible to find this. Hand drawn map, 1771 of the Bradford and Estate. Maybe too hard for you to see, but this estate of 1,600 acres, Bradford and State monies, Royal Estate purchased it. Little drawings of the different parts of farms that are being rented out. Twice a year, the rents are collected by someone at the Bradford Inn. Money goes to our, our school's agent in London, comes back to William and Mary to support the Indian school. And I could find enough information on this, even when we went to the Bradford and I went to the cemetery, it's like, oh, there's Mr. Clough. I know him from the, the list on the wrist. Unbelievable. It, it is all there. You can follow it, follow the tobacco, follow the land sales, lands that Native people are being pushed into giving up their lands and trading and move, moving elsewhere. And so on the one hand, you have money coming from the Bradford Inn. On the other hand, out of particularly the York River, tobacco, skins, and furs going the other way, generating money, et cetera. So by interrogating, my point is, by interrogating these documents, it became clear, again, that tribes were in, I'll put these general categories, trading partners, military alliances, or treaty Indians. And those are, then you can follow and see, these are the, the sons that are at the school. So this is what we kind of gleaned from it. I get a lot of questions uh, about this, but I wanted to add another. When we went to, I hadn't yet seen the map. We hadn't yet found it when we were in Bradford. And, but looking at it later, some of these buildings still exist. It was kind of neat to walk in this, this village. This is the kind of um, documents you see about skins and furs, and the, the amounts of furs and different kinds that are being brought in from native activity into this area to go overseas. It's absolutely enormous. These are kinds of expenses for native people, clothing, and then there are some medical records. These had been known, but now we put them in a different way. And some lists of students that you see on the other side in Bursar's books, most of the students there, not all. Charles Murphy is a Cherokee. The others are Pamunkey uh, students, and some of those names still exist today on the Pamunkey Reservation. So the primary question I get, OK, who is at the school? This was tough, pulling this together. And you see immediately, if you can, uh, first thing I'll deal with is the first one, because everyone says, oh, you know, enslaved Indians, yes and no. These captive boys were enslaved by the Catawba, and a trader from Williamsburg traded for them and brought them out. They stayed, they're the first students. Tribes were all a little bit reluctant in a time of slavery, to send their sons, they wanted some guarantees. How are these kids going to be safe when, we're there, when they're there? For the best that Buck and I can tell, these students basically acted like, for, stayed for years as sort of dorm helpers. They did not know their original languages or where, where they were from. But you can begin to see the changes here. And Chickahominy, Meharan, et cetera, can read them. So maybe I wish I knew the name from Chickahominy. But what is important, I began to think about this. These boys initially 
are boys. They're eight, nine, 10 years old. And we all know it's a lot easier to learn a foreign language when you're a kid than when you are older. And I'm thinking about Thomasina used to say to me, you know, yeah, we came here, we learned English because the rest of you could not learn our languages, you weren't able to. So now we're speaking your language, which is a little bit funny, but a little bit biting in that statement. But notice, they're primarily tribal names. And I ask you to think about that with me. There's a British-run school. At this point, it's England, not yet Britain. Are they going to be interested that it's this little Billy so-and-so here? Are they going to say, no, I want the, I have a Chickahominy represented. I have somebody from Nottaway. We have Pamunkey here. These kids are representing their communities. And that was important to the British. Who do we have here? Who are they, et cetera? 17, 13, 17 students, I don't know, but 17. How many did Harvard have? For almost 40 years, five. Look at the numbers. And the other thing is, I had to say to myself, it's, this is not the William and Mary of today with five or 6,000. How many non-Indian students are there? 20, 30, look at the numbers. Maybe half are native in their own building, everybody eating together. It makes us have to, to think in a new way about this. So um, where you see a bolded name, I want to come back to that. It's another list right to the end here. Towards some of these, you start to see names. I have some ideas about that. We could kind of talk about it. But we are able to link the students who are now a bit older, they're no longer eight and nine, They've got, they start coming later in time and they're more teenager age. Um, we can track them through documents and other things and this is really, really exciting. So we begin to see and question, is the Bradford an assimilationist school or is the, are these students acting as adjuncts for their own tribes? against England's colonial policies. I like to think this section of following some of these students briefly, that they leave their mark on history. And it was we who were the ones who forgot. So with a great deal of dogged work and a lot of good fortune, we found some 18th century documents, first ones that were, that were identified, because we'd been in their records so long, that we're either referring to or made by Bradford and student. So the one on the left is really extraordinary. This is a Nottaway land indenture. And you can see the date is stamped on it, 1740. And what this is, is the chief fleet leaders of Nottaway are making an agreement with the English, and they had to sign the agreement. So they are not able to write in it, you know, this is quill pen and ink, folks. This is hard to do some good script. But they put their fingerprint in a red seal on the document saying we agree, and someone else is writing their names. And we see who that is in the very bottom, because he doesn't have a red seal. He's the, he's the scribe. He's the interpreter. He's Robert Scholar. He's a Bradford and student. Next, <clears throat> pardon me, next document. Hard for you to see. It's handwritten by George Washington. In this letter, 1756, what Washington is actually asking for, he said, I need to have Tom take this letter back to his people and read it to them in their language. And what Washington is asking for is soldiers to help fight in the French and Indian War. So help me with this now. Here it is in English. Give it to Tom. It's written in English. Tom's going to read it and speak it out in his native language. We think it's Tom Stepp, who's not away. Why do I think that? Because Washington, when he was here, to train for his certification 
to be a land surveyor as a teenager was here when Tom Stepp was here as a teenager. It's impossible that they wouldn't have known each other. So it's the Tom, give it to Tom, and Tom Stepp is speaking Iroquoian language. The very bottom in Washington's hand, which is amazing, says, and here, by the way, Tom, here's a piece of wampum for doing this for us, and I'll come back to that. I think that's pretty special. Here we have a letter from John Montour. Look at the handwriting. It's so beautiful. Catawba, Bradford and student. Top right, Henry Bobby, our last, our last student, Wyandotte. This is a piece of espionage. Is this not incredible? In George Washington's papers, nobody had ever said, well, who, who's Henry Bobby? You look at our, oh, Henry Bobby, he's a Bradford student. What is Henry Bobby doing? He's given us a drawing a Fort Pitt is a piece of espionage to give to the Americans. Here's what's on the inside. Someone else is clearly speaking to Bobby because in a very faded writing, you can tell there's remnants of conversation. He says the horses are here. He says this is, but that Bobby's signature is on the top. We know it's his. I think these are amazing documents that counter the concept that Bradford and students didn't do anything, that it was a failure. Our next goal was to think about how do I take what I have learned and try to reconnect with Native people and get their response, to hear from them, like, no, you're wrong, that's crazy. Don't do it. So we decided to look for a native response among four groups. Excuse me. Each of the works that we asked for um, were important statements. And they all reminded us eventually of a shared history that exists between William and Mary and historically affiliated tribes who send students here. The important point part to me about this is not just about the past. We have extant, vibrant indigenous communities in Virginia. They're not living in the past. They're very much in the present and working on projects that are important to their communities. So it seemed essential to go to them. Um, one other thing that, that we did that this is a next push and pull event. It's going to be a renovation of the Bradford and Building, 2009. So it's just some other kind of air conditioning, whatever. And my students in anthropology were like, like, this is the moment. Let's go. All right, mobilize. Went to the administration. We said, before you do that, could we, um, how about having, invite Native people for a ceremony? And a little bit, it was like, why would you do that? And I said, because it was an Indian school. Oh, great. Um, really? What we did. Asked President Reevely, would he attend? He's right there. And we found four students, graduates of William and Mary. And guess what? They are living legacies of the Bradford and students who went here in the 18th century. So we have the late uh, Meharan, Paige Archer. Next to Paige, we have Reggie Stewart, second chief right now at Chickahominy. Ashley Spivey, Pamunkey. And um, Annette Sanuk, Clapsaddle, Eastern Band Cherokee. He said, would you come and say some remarks? And they did. And we also invited some musicians. They gave an honor song. And there was a, a prayer offering to do that. And then the excavation went, went forward. In the, in the excavation photo, the side, uh, I'm there, uh, Mark Costro, one of our students, Buck Woodard, my co-author of this work. But the two, uh, the late Jeff Brown and Ashley Spivey, both of Pamunkey, guess what? They worked on the project. My colleague, Martin Gallivan, 
worked with them on archaeology, and they felt like, hey, what an opportunity. Not only just come and say something or have a song, but you be part of the excavation of the place where your ancestors went to school. So that was special. So we went out to tribal, four, four groups, because we could follow a named individual. First tribe we went to was Pamunkey. Pamunkey had more Native students at the Bradford Inn throughout its decades than any other group. And we worked with the former chief, Kevin Brown. Talked to him, showed him what we found, and said, OK, um, Kevin, we'd like you to make a response. And here I have to have a shout out to the Muscarelli Museum of Art. As I approached the museum, and I said, um, I'd like to commission some art, some native art. Museum said, OK, what do you have in mind? Well, I don't know what it's going to be, but I would like you to sponsor it. And I have to say, they said, sure, yes, we'll do this for you. And not every museum would say, yeah, here's some money. Go ahead, do whatever you want. But they, the Muscarelli did. So these pieces that I'm going to show you are part of now our collection, and they're at the museum. So Kevin, he's my friend now, excuse me, Chief Brown, said, I'd like some images of documents. And I didn't know what he was going to make. We made it clear to every artist and every community that we reached out to, you make whatever statement you'd want. I am not expecting you to say this was a great idea. You decide is what your community response is. So this is what came back, a collage. Um, and it's titled William and Mary Indians. He is saying, yeah, guess who your Indians mostly were? That's us. At top of this, you see an image of the, that badge, Queen of Pamunkey. That's referring to 1677 treaty signed somewhere near here. Terrell Bradby, uh, uh, one of his, uh, a leader. But he's mixed just what, what we were thinking in my research team, the land sales, the names of, of people, the, the charter that they were aware of, all in this collage. I think that is pretty special statement. Henry Ball B's community, Wyandotte, the guy who did the espionage. Now, we could talk a little bit more tonight, where I won't have time, about Henry Ball B. He sort of disappears, and it's a little bit confusing to me, but the Wyandots are really French allied, and what's he doing at a British school? And there is some evidence when the paper trail on him stops that there's somebody in the American uh, Continental Army that says, which side is this guy on? So then it, the, I can't find him in the documents anymore. But Bob B's community, look what they, they produce, this magnificent ceramic piece with both French influence that talks about their alliance with the French, but embedded in the rim are very traditional elements that are part of a Wyandotte tattoos, design elements. And he, it, this statement is really, we're, we're a people in two, two worlds. And that's what he acknowledges. The next commission was to the Nottaway community. And this was made by Archie Elliott, councilman in Nottaway, who is in the audience. And I, I have to remember to acknowledge the Native people who are in the audience at the end of this talk. Um, but we went to the Bradford Inn. Uh, I'm sorry, the Nottaway community and said, here's what we found. They listened, OK. They said, would you like to make a response? This was the extraordinary response that we got from this community, uh, made by Councilman Archie Elliott. The decision to create a wampum belt has great significance among Iroquoian-speaking people. Constructed from quahog shells, Wampum belts were and are symbolic and documentary objects. They are their own text. 
comparable to what we would write on paper for our Iroquoian people. This is a text. It can symbolize all kinds of things, but encoded in wampum. They say wampum belts. They're not really worn, but just they have that term. Encoded in the design elements are physical and metaphorical references in this one to the transformational journey that Nottaway Indian students took at the Brafferton. They're aware, they always sent to, there they are, and that line as that path to the Brafferton is very, very clear. Amazing. Living document. The last piece, the final work, is by the late Shan Goshorn, Eastern Band Cherokee. We went to Eastern Band with the Charles Murphy story. I didn't talk to you much about him. Murphy's a Bradford student, known as a linguister, apparently very skilled in languages. He helped to negotiate numerous agreements on the back country between the English and later the Americans and the Cherokee. Charles Murphy served as Patrick Henry's translator. What an extraordinary thing for a Bradford student to do. These men, Wyandotte, uh, Dobby, Patrick Henry's um, translator, the Pamunkey, the Nottaway with George Washington, and who else knows what else because this doesn't come up in the papers. They're at extraordinarily important moments in history with key figures in American history, and they need to be remembered for that. So Sean Goshorn came and said very specifically, she came from Oklahoma and spent three days in Williamsburg, walking around our campus, going with me to Swim Library, looking at every single document that I had that I could share. And she said very specifically, said, Danielle, I came here, I came here, I'm very negative about this. I said, I am not here to talk you into anything. Not what, we want an honest response. Sean's work was known for her unique and imaginative constructions of incorporating historic maps, treaties, tribal documents, etc., into her work. This basket is called Laying the Foundation. And both this basket and the wampum belt are out for you to see tonight in the room that there, there will be for a reception. So I hope if you can stay to see these actual pieces. So I mentioned what Sean had said. And she later contacted me asking for a number of images of PDFs of different things. And she wrote, when I, I looked it up, I have an email, several from her, so I will quote. I was fascinated to learn about this important historical institution and its connection to my tribe. The Brafferty did not try to eliminate native culture and language, I now see. Instead, the schoolmasters encouraged students to maintain their ties to their tribes and languages. Students were being groomed to become liaisons tr and translators between their tribes and colonial dignitaries. In Shan's work, I will show you part of her thinking. She shared these images back with me after requesting documents. And you may recognize the charter, Robert Boyle's will, et cetera, statements, an image of the Brafferton that's on the cover of my book that I love because part of the building is there and part of it isn't there. And it's sort of metaphorically like this search for more. As well as on the inside of the basket are words that were spoken by Annette Sapp Cladl during the rededication of the Bradford after the renovation. Here is a photo. I was so pleased she took this of the, what I sent. Images, some of the documents you may recognize from a few minutes ago. And 
documents are printed on a kind of archival splint. This is something that she developed, it's pretty extraordinary. And then they're cut strips that you'll recognize, words from, that were spoken, grouping them, putting it together to create and weave her response of Cherokee response to the Bradford Indian School. Pretty special. Sean said she incorporated the sun element at the top of the basket as a symbol of enlightenment. And at the base is the Cherokee pattern that's called noonday sun to offer indigenous balance to the William and Mary symbol. When these works came, we had also concurrently spent about two years putting together a concept of an exhibition. This is uh, the, out, the banner outside. It's Archie Elliott, maker of the wampum belt. This is the banner we use, again, for the museum exhibit. The museum's closed right now, but this was on the side wall. And Lynette Alston, chief of the Nottaway tribe. This gives you a scene inside. I thought, you know, you can talk like tonight. I could talk and I could say, here's what I think. This is, no, in this exhibit, I said, here's the evidence. Here are the actual documents. Everything real. You look. You think. You decide. Surprising, the group of, of men looking at the exhibit, they came from Oklahoma. They're that interested in the Bradford in School history. It's quite special. And that night, outside the museum, they held a stomp dance, well attended by students. This piece was not commissioned, but came to us by another not away person, Denise Wallace. She said, you know, I made, she said, Professor, I made a story quilt. You might want to look at it. This is now in the collection of SWEM, a Special Collections Research Center. And this is her story quilt of kids at the Bradford Inn. And I think she has captured an aspect of the humanity of the school, that it's hard to get past a lot of the other layers of colonialism and other kinds of talk, which are real things. But Denise has captured sort of the exuberance of these. These are kids. They're 8, 9, 10 outside the building that now houses Peggy's office and the president's office. So you don't have these kids around. But I love this piece. And it was made, made by her. So I want to say a couple of things about outcomes. The work has produced some outcomes. And this slide shows some of them, so I'm just going to quickly mention. I want to thank former Dean Kate Conley, because after all of this came forth, she said, yes, uh, OK, Native Studies minor. That's a big, big thing. I love that. Our book, the Buck and I did, many other essays in there uh, by other scholars, Native and non-Native. Land acknowledgment that President Rowe has brought forward. Last Charter Day, 11 tribal leaders came to Charter Day. Very, very special, first time that happened. Um, thanks to Deans uh, Suzanne Raid and Sylvia Tontesieras, we have two new faculty in Native Studies coming. This is terrific news. Um, we have a presidential liaison for strategic cultural partnerships headed up by Anne Marie Stock. Athletic departments doing all kinds of interesting outreach at making people of tribal communities feel like they can come, come to a game, et cetera. Expanding our collection of native art, the Muscarelli, thank you, David Brashear, Melissa Paris. I know I'll be leaving things out. The establishment by the Negrato Sapnar family for endowment for native studies. And if you heard music when you came in, 
That's by Mohawk musician Don Avery. It is fitting this evening to close with remarks made by the Bradford and Legacy group member, Annette Senate Clap Saddle. These words appear on the inside of Sean Goshorn's basket. Quote, the Bradford and Indian School symbolizes relationships between the College of William and Mary and the descendants of indigenous people. Let us not simply commemorate a building, but rather the relationship built with tools and implements of learning, honoring wisdom and knowledge. Let us sow a new crop of understanding and shared responsibility, cultivating life-sustaining harvests for the students and the communities we serve. Thank you very much. I will take, uh, there's time for a couple of questions, but before I do that, I want to do two things. One, I'd like to ask the students from our uh, American Indian Students Association to stand. I have several of them here tonight. They are the living legacy of Native students at our school. Thank you. Secondly, I am aware that there are several uh, tribal members, representatives of communities in the audience. Would you please stand so that we can acknowledge and thank you. Uh, yay. Thank you. And I'm, I'm going to say something. I see Lenora Atkins is here from Chickahominy and your federal petition mentioned the fact that you had the, your community send students to the Bradford and Indian School at William & Mary, and that's pretty extraordinary. Thank you to, to your community for that. Any questions, or you just want to have some cider, look at the art, and have some cookies? It's up to you. <laughs> It's not a test. This is what I say in class. It's not a test. It's okay. I also, uh, if it's okay, I want to acknowledge, I have a number of my uh, members of my department. I'm really pleased to see Jenny Kahn, Audrey Horning, and Martin Gallivan, who have always been supportive of this work. But Thomas Cena Jordan was known to Tomoko Hamada, who was our, our chair. And the reason we have the American Indian Resource Center at all is due to Tom, uh, Tomoko, I must say that. Thank you, Tomoko. Yeah, I'm going to clap for you. No questions? Oh. Hi, Danielle. Hi, Danielle. Thank you. I'm over here. Hi. That was a great talk. So moving. Um, you, the history and the the ledgers with the student numbers, to what do you attribute, you know, there are some years where you know there were 17 students, and then like the next year, there's only one listed. Is it just that there's just scattered records, or there was no specific diary that kept the roster year to year? Okay. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I can speak to that, and that's so frustrating. And now, now I'm, going, I'm really going to call out um, our founder, the Reverend James Blair. Because it is very clear that the Reverend James Blair is supposed to give, all you now are worried about, your, there are administrators in the room here, <laughs> is supposed to give an annual account of what's going on. And I think I can see a lot, often, frequently, Blair goes over in person. Instead of writing it up, he's probably saying, you know, no, it's doing really, yeah, we got, we got 17, okay, 40. Yeah, okay, so uh, th I think that's what happened. That's why I went to Lambeth Palace. Like, where are the blasted documents? Oh, here's one for this year. 
nothing here. Oh, he's here visiting that year. He didn't write it. So that, that's, it's such a frustrating component of trying to do original work, but you just, you guys got to go through everything. And I'm thinking maybe if I had time and more years or whatever, there may be other, they're not archives, but letters and records from other individuals who are part of this ecclesiastical network that may have a word, a name, whatever. Um, but that's the problem. Blair did not do all his record keeping. At least it, it seems that way. And any other question? You ready for the test? <laughs> um, that's loud, sorry. <laughs> um, thank you for your talk, Danielle. Um, so I was curious, this is a two-parter, by the way. Um, firstly, is the project of discovering these names an ongoing one, sort of in the way that the Lemon Project continues to seek out the names of um, people enslaved by the college? Um, and then secondly, I was just curious whether um, native um, oral histories um, from the native nations that you've collaborated with have been able to shine any light on um, thank you. Exploring this. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, let me think about a good way to answer that. Yes, it's ongoing. And I think, um, and I don't know if this will go backwards. Um, maybe up to Chandler. I'm not going to. This is another thank you thing. Wait. Yeah. This in a way, all of these things are ongoing, Matt. So they're all ongoing. It, all, it takes a while to get to be engaged, which build trust. Uh, that's why I told that story. It, it's, it, we all laughed. I laughed. Like, I left some nervous, like, like, hello? Yeah, hello? We haven't heard in two centuries, but yeah. You know, and it's not like one call. And it's not because, oh, we had people attend Charter Day, which was fabulous. Then what? Then what? How we build a relationship. Regarding oral history, I'm, I'm open to that, and oral traditions. What people, communities would say, we, we know, we have this memory, we don't always know the names, but I'd say to you, after 300 years, can you tell me exactly everything that, that, with the school, uh, I'm sorry, everything in your family history? We can't, and, other, and, and this work, I feel, is important. It's important to our campus. Tribes are dealing with many other huge issues. Can, pulling together the every little piece of the Brafford, but I think they're interested. The other thing that I don't think I said that came up with regular statements was we know we used to be there. There's another point, and can we come back? But also, we were important then. That's why we were there. And that feeling of, you know, hey, the rest of you non-native people, you've forgotten the uh, centrality of our people and our communities in the 18th century. That, in a way, I suppose, is kind of the oral history of it. Uh, but no, I, I guess I can do more. I'm not saying I'm dropping. This is the end. But now you know what we know to this point. <laughs> I hope that answered your question. Yes. Danielle, are there plans to uh, disseminate th this new story, th this new perspective, um, in ways that uh, can kind of transplant the, the old story in perhaps campus tours or a plaque in front of the Brafferton or, or some way that, that the, the um, community at William & Mary um, will be able to, to tell this new story, which I'm, I'm really eager to, to tell and I'm really eager for other people to, to be able to know it? I think that's a larger conversation with the administration. I wouldn't say there aren't. But I think this is a process. Dealing with new kinds of thoughts in history, there's the, it's a process. And at the same time, and I didn't you know, go into it in great detail this evening, there's this whole other movement of boarding schools, and it's bad, and this. And my, when I talk, go to this, my students, no one here, of course, tonight, but when I students are ready to say, this is bad, and I'm like, wait, wait. Let's deconstruct. So that idea of the world of the complex 18th century and a landscape right here in this coastal Virginia and what native people are trying to do 
and they have situated themselves in, in different ways. And I suppose one way to, to really conclude this talk is, you know what, they succeeded. The mem members of communities are in this room tonight. The students are here, they succeeded to survive the onslaught of colonialism. So I think going forward with anything, I think, um, I don't, I'm not saying my job is done, but going forward in any ways requires going forward with indigenous communities and what, how they want to think about this further beyond the commissions. And I, I hope I made clear why I chose those groups because I could find names and follow individuals more deeply into history and bring, bring that back to the community for a response. And really, I want to say, I had no idea what was coming. You're going to see two spectacular things in a moment. Anything else? I'm not sure if there's a hand. If not, I'll be out there and you can talk to me. And I'll say thank you again for coming. Go, get, go look at the art. It's upstairs. Thank you.